Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi Rabbil alemin. Ve salatu ve selamu ala eşrafil enbiyai vel mursalin. Muhammed ve ala alihi ve ashabihi ecma'in. Amma ba'd. Ekhotel İslami ibadallah. I'd like to welcome the believers to another episode of Heavyweight Dialogue. And this particular evening, we'll be taking a look at the subject, the realities of, uh, the reality of sexless marriages, the reality of sexless marriages. Now, first, before we continue, uh, we have, we have, or I have with me, uh, our participants, one, a regular participant, Abu Abdullah Ismail, and then we have a uh, a different participant uh, this evening, our brother Hassan Abdurrahman Al Amriki. Hassan Abdurrahman Al Amriki, who is uh, who who has been on his channel before. Now, when dealing with this particular subject, the subject of sexless marriages. And this is something that's very important as it relates to uh, the Muslim community uh, as pertains to the preservation of marriage. And uh, the reality is we don't want to see any marriage come to an end. And a sexless marriage can be that which could bring or is the means to bring a marriage to an end. And no one is is pleased with that. In reality, the only one that is pleased with the breaking up of a husband and wife is the shaitan. The Prophet Sallallahu he taught us, Inna Iblis yad'u arshahu ma wa yub'athu sarayahu fa'adnahum minhu manzilatan a'adhamuhum fitna. The Prophet ﷺ, he stated, undoubtedly, Iblis, he placed his throne over the water, and then he sent out his troops. And so the, the closest to him in regards to ranks or levels is he who is greatest in fitna. And when we get to the end of the narration, uh, the Prophet ﷺ, he stated, ثُمَّ يَجِيءُ أَحَدَهُمْ فَيَقُولُ مَا تَرَقْتُهُ that I did, he said he stated that one from amongst them will come and he will say I did not leave him yani the, a man until he separated or split from his woman yani his wife for you to need he minhu so the so iblis brings him close to him for yakul ni'ma ant Yani he states and he says to this individual how excellent you are, how excellent you are. So again, when it comes to this the, the subject of sexless marriages, then what is fear is that this can be a means to the breaking up of a family, to the breaking up of a husband and wife. So when dealing with this particular subject concerning sexless marriages, the New York Times, they quote, they cited a study that st basically stated that 15 percent of marriages within the U.S. And we know marriages are on, are on the all time low here in the U.S. The 15 percent of marriages are sexless. Other studies uh, state 10 percent. Others state ten, between 10 and 20 percent. 10 and 20 percent of marriages are sexless marriages. Now, as it relates to sexless marriages, the definition varies depending on what professional you're speaking to. But some would say a sexless marriage is no sex within six months, six months to a year. Others would say no sex in a year. Others would say no sex or excuse me, sex 10 times or less within a year. And this is and this particular type, uh, this particular definition is also referred to as semi-sexless 
marriage or low sex marriage. So these are the, the definitions or how this particular uh, term is, is understood. Now, when it comes to a healthy marriage, then what is stated is that a healthy marriage, the average, an average couple has sex 60 times <clears throat> in a year. That is basically once a week. It's basically once a week. They're, they're having sex at least once a week. This is uh, as it pertains to what, what, what, what some would consider to be a healthy marriage. Now, when looking at that and saying now that we want to go into the subject uh, concerning uh, tonight's topic. And first and foremost, I want to throw this out to, to, to the participants or to the guests. First, does lack of sex in a marriage mean lack of love between the spouses? And because our brother Hassan Abdul Rahman uh, is a guest this evening or tonight, then I have him start uh, his response as it relates to that question. And Barakalofi. Let's see. Your, your voice is kind of low. I don't know if something happened with the volume after you made the introduction. So I, your voice is low on my end. Oh, yeah? Uh, yes. Uh, let me see. It was after the opening. It so seemed you that you You didn't hear? Did you, were you able to hear what I said or? Um, one minute. Okay, so what was the question again? Did you, you were, were were you able to hear what I said as it relates to the introduction? Yeah, or? I heard most of what you said is just low. That's all. Just just the sound is low, but I can, I can hear you. Okay, yes. okay. Um, I don't know how to correct that. To be quite honest. <laughs> okay, don't worry about it. But yeah. what was the question? Uh, the question was: um, Does lack of sex in a marriage mean lack of love between spouses? Hmm. Bismillah and alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi amma ba'du. Me, uh, anytime I delve into a, an issue, speak on an issue, I do try my best to define the topic. Uh, so you said, does lack of sex. Mm -hmm. So we would have to define what how does something become lacking? Right? Well, from from what was just um from mm -hmm. what was just presented. Uh, right. from what was just presented. So if a person is only having maybe sexual relations, if a couple's only having sexual relations ten times in one year, for instance. Right. Right. So sex um is like food and drink. And I don't mean uh, in its status in the life of human beings. You know, human beings in general, they are united in the four category categories of life. Life falls into, everything in life falls into one of four categories. It's either number one, a necessity, number two, a need, Number three, a want, or number four, a luxury. When I say necessity, because this is a word that's abused by many people, calling things necessities. So when I say necessity, I mean that which life and limb depends on, that which you would die if you didn't get it. Number two, and we're talking about from totally a worldly perspective, because when we talk about necessities religiously, then we're, that, that, that falls into a a different conversation. So we're just talking about the act of sex in general. We're including all human beings, regardless of uh, uh, spiritual practice and uh, religious denomination and other than that, then we're just talking about the human race. Then like I said before, four. 
So necessity is that which, if you don't have it, you'll die. Like food and drink. A need is something that if you don't have it, life becomes extremely difficult. Difficult, Afwan. Like clothing and shelter. A want is the thing that if you have it, it makes life comfortable like having a sufficient number of rooms to house each member of the family, to be able to separate the girls from the boys, so forth. The mother and father have their own room, private space, and like that, right? A want. A luxury are those things that make life special, like having a luxur luxurious car and a, you know, a big home, a villa, or a mansion, and things like that. So now, when we look at it from that aspect, um, and we're talking about the institution of marriage, then going back to what I said earlier that sex is like food and drink, meaning that humans partake of food and drink based on their individual appetite. So it's impossible for one human being to inflect his or her appetite on another human being, to look at a human being and say, you've had enough or you've had too much. And what that brings about is the necessity of the spouses knowing each other's appetite outside of food and drink as, as it comes to sex. We know in Islam that it is the right of both couples, of both parties of the couple, the male and the female, to be satisfied sexually. As a matter of fact, the main reason for marriage at the top of the list is in order to have a lawful way of fulfilling our sexual appetite. And we know this from the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Sunan, when he said what? Ya ma'ashara shabab he said, O oh, group of young, of youth, or young men, those of you who have the ability of al-ba'ata, and al-ba'ata, the ulama say what? That is the, the ability to fulfill the financial rights, house the woman, and the ability to have al-jima'ah, the, the ability to have intercourse. So whoever has the ability to feed a woman and also have intercourse, then he should get married. And whoever doesn't have that ability, he said, why? He said, then he should fast. Before he said that, he said, So, so, so he said, because it is better in helping you lower your gaze and it's the strongest thing in helping you protect your private parts. So now this institution of marriage, the top reason for it is in order to have a lawful means in order to uh, achieve fulfilling the, these carnal desires that we have that were, were created, were created with these carnal desires. So now each individual couple has to know one another's appetite, just like they know in food and drink. Uh, uh, the woman knows her husband, what he eats and how much he eats. She knows how to, this is the, you know, um, and, I'm, and I'm talking about, and I like to say this sometimes that you have the real, you have the ideal situation. You have the real situation. The ideal situation, the woman studies her husband. He, she knows his appetite and she fixes his plate. When she fixes his meals, she fixes his plate according to what she knows he eats. And then she adds to that or brings him more based on what she knows from his appetite, the same thing with the drink. Well, likewise, a wise woman knows that thing, think about her husband, his sexual appetite, you know, um, and so forth. So now, so in Islam, we know that this is the right of both couples. However, this is the right of the man by way of service. Sexual intercourse is the right of the man by way of service. To the point that the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned that the woman who does not answer the call of her husband to intercourse, then the angel will curse her into the morning. So this is her, his right over her by way of service. And it is the right of the woman by way of justice. As Allah Ta'ala said in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَلَهُنَّ مِثْلُ الَّذِي عَلَيْهِنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَلِرِجَالِ عَلَيْهِنَّ دَرَجَةِ 
Wallahu azizun hakim. Allah said, and for the women are similar rights to those that are enjoined upon them according to what is ma'aruf, according to that which is known based on culture and custom. And the men have a degree over them. And Allah is the most mighty, the most wise. So now, looking into it this way. Now, so each uh, participant before, in this... Before you continue, I think that there yeah. needs to be an emphasis on that, on that point uh, concerning uh, the reality that when it comes to sexual relations, the role of uh, when it when if when the fall when that role falls on the woman, it's a service that she that she has to implement to concerning to her husband. And when it fall that responsibility falls on the man, it is fulfilled upholding justice. No. Uh, no. I think those two things have to be understood because uh one, because we're people that are living in this society born and raised, we're indoctrinated with a lot of false ideas. And from those false ideas that are propagated within the society is that men and women are equal. And so a lot of times uh, brothers and sisters enter uh, marriages uh, with the same outlook of the people generally in society. And so a woman may be looking at her want for sexual relations being equal in magnitude and equal as it relates to uh, the, the basic duty mm -hmm. as the man. She's looking at herself exactly as the man or the, or the man is looking at the woman exactly uh, in the same manner as, as himself. No. And that's a mistake, especially in light of what the text teaches us. So I think that's a very important a very important emphasis to be made, especially as it relates to this subject, because uh, when looking at certain situations, when people may have that mentality, or in some cases, in the case of the woman, who may see herself as above the fray, uh, she may be lacking in in in uh, put in uh, implementing something that is considered to be a service. That she's supposed to fulfill, and Allah knows best. But continue, Achi. Nah, yeah. So yeah, I'll just uh, emphasize on that a little bit uh, as you suggested. So now, um, this is basically the entire marriage bond in Islam, and even if you look into the text of of other religions, it's the same thing that the woman's participation is servitude and the man's participation is justice. So the man is being just based on the servitude he's receiving. It's like Sheikh al-Islam mentioned that uh, the, the marriage bond is based on maintenance and service. So there is no maintenance for the one that doesn't render service. And likewise, there is no service for the one that doesn't, what, provide maintenance. And this is the reality, you know, and you have to have for anything a basic frame. And I call it personally, in my terminology in English, I call it rules of engagement. And this is one of the biggest problem in every kind of relationship. But of course, we're talking about the marital relationship. The, one of the biggest problems is that rules of engagement are not discussed, they are assumed. And this is what leads to clashing in the end because everybody assumes that the other one knows what they expect. Hmm. And it's not safe to assume, especially in a diverse society that we live in. Uh, and this diversity requires, if we look at the Athar or the Hadith rather of Umar radiallahu anhu after the Hijrah to Medina, and he married a woman of Medina and he went to have uh, intercourse with her, there, one of the tafsirs of Surah Al-Baqarah. And he said, he came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, Ya Rasulullah Halak. And we know that in Medina, they the, the, the, the Arabs here before is there, before Islam, they had a big influence from the Jews. <clears throat> we know that the Jews have many superstitions that would, as, as relates to women and intercourse and things like that. 
So he said, Ya Rasulullah halakt. Right? He said, I've been destroyed. He said, Ma ahlakaka. He said, and what has destroyed you? He said, he said, I turned my riding beast around the, uh, the, uh, the other night, meaning that he had intercourse with his wife through her vagina from behind. And this was something that the Jews frowned upon, and they had a superstition that that the child would come out cross-eyed. You know, this was the superstition. So his wife of Medina, she fussed with him about that. This is not for my people. And, and she said, I'm not going to let you do this to me. You're not turning me around to have intercourse with me in this way. Right? So then she took her argument to the prophet. And of course, as some of the scholars of Tafsir says, and this is when the ayat uh, came down. Uh, right? Right? Your, your women are a tilth to you, so approach your tilth in any way you wish, right? So uh, because the effect, you know, she was she entered into Islam when the Ansar accepted Islam and went to Medina, so they still kept some of the traditions of the Jews when it came to food and drink and even intimate relations. So this happened there. Likewise today, look at the melting pot or the so-called melting pot of America with so many different cultures blending together. So now two people get married from these cultural diversities in the most private situation. Those cultural diversities are exposed. And both go in with, an expe with expectations in intimacy, right? So now here we go, the couple comes together. So now, uh, as Sheikh al-Islam explained, the man has a particular right. The woman's right and justice is summed up in the ahkam al safar in ahkam al safar in the rulings regarding traveling. And Umar radiallahu anhu, when he was the Khalifa, and he passed by the home of a woman, and she was saying poetry. And in her poetry, she said, if it wasn't for the fear of Allah, these bedposts would be shaking right now, meaning that she would be being intimate with a man other than her husband. Her husband had been uh, inducted into the soldiers, and he had been off at battle. So Umar anhu, when he heard the woman make this statement, he raced to his daughter Hafsa, and he asked Hafsa, Kam an How long can a woman be patient with her husband being what? Being absent. So Hafsa anha, she said, four months. After that, Umar anhu, any man who was uh, inducted into the army of the Muslims and was sent off to battle or to watch a post or whatever like that, after he was given six months only to be uh, away from his wife, and then the ulama, of course, as time passed and traveling became different, they said it was four months because Umar was at six months because it would take a month for a person to get there and a month for the person to get back and add it with the four months of him being absent and like that. So that was based upon Umar being the Khalifa and looking at the, the, the poetry that that woman said, you know, while her husband was away and like that. So now, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, he summed it up and he said, okay, these are the technical, or the meaning of what he said is, this, these, this is a, these are the technical rights when we say to the woman. The woman, the man, his right is when he demands it. Bil ma'roof, according to that which is just. We understand the woman could be sick. I mean, literally sick, not faking sick. The woman could be sick tired, whatever, so distracted, and other than that, right? And same thing for, for the man. However, the man has the right for the service, so he gets to demand it. The woman doesn't have the liberty of demanding, telling her husband, calling her husband to the bed, and if he doesn't come to the bed, the angels curse him. That's not, his, that's not the situation. However, the man, because of the ayah, and for those women are similar rights to those that are joined upon them, according to that which is right, uh, are just, then of course the man now has to look and investigate into the desires of his woman. Right? He knows her pattern of, he should know her pattern of desires. And when her desires are at a height, when her de desires are at a low, and then he treats her because his job and her job are the same when it comes to what? al -ifa. That both of them have the job of keeping each other chaste. The man and the woman in marriage in Islam, they both have a duty of keeping each other chaste. 
So the man has to have intercourse. This is basically the, the most basic understanding of intercourse, uh, uh, intimacy, intimacy between spouses, is that each person has to make themselves available to the other enough, at, at the very least, enough to keep the other one chaste, that they don't have excuse for having relations outside of marriage. Wallahu a'la wa a'la. Now, Barakalofik, um, Asmaya, I will pose a question to you. And that question being, um, does lack of sexual relations in the marriage necessitate lack of love? And uh, that question is being posed because we know that this, if something like this is occurring in a marriage, it could be a source of frustration. It could be a source of frustration on um, the the people involved in that marriage. It can also be a means for the shaitan to whisper, you know, and to, and to place varying types of doubt, doubts in the hearts of the, of the couple. So the question is, does lack of sexual relations in the marriage necessitate lack of love or mean that there's lack of love between the spouses? Um, Bismillah, salatu salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa man tamasaka bi sunnati ila yawm al-deen. I think in some cases it can. Um, I don't think that's every case. Uh, if you look at some couples, there are some couples, because there's different reasons why people have lack of intimacy, right? The the, the reason for lack of in, intimacy, it varies. It's not, you know, everybody doesn't have the same reason why they didn't have a sex tape. Husband and wife may love each other. And then when we mean love, it, what kind of, are we talking about the kind of love that, you know, is, is like connected to, you know, loyalty and, you know, mashallah, you've been with me for this amount of time. We've been together. You had these many children or you've taken care of, you know, me for this many years. We've been, you know, this, that kind of natural love that just you have kind of like, you know, for a relative or somebody that's been with you for a period of time and you appreciate the kind of person they are. Or are we talking about the kind of love that's, you know, connected to romance, like they're in love, they're infatuated and things like that. Right. So if, if we're talking about just in general, like just general love, like the, the love that we expect, that mawadda that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talk about in the Quran, we say, that kind of love that's attached to affection and, you know, um, um, you know, attraction, that kind of love like that, that really makes you connect with a person on that level. Um, then. And I, and I believe that seems to be the most appropriate way to contextualize love in the, within this question. I would say, you know, in some cases it can mean, it can necessitate a lack of love. And in some cases, it, it doesn't necessarily have to. If you take a case when a woman, let's say we have medical reasons like postpartum stress, some people have had um, some sexual uh, perversions, right, done to them or they've been victims and from you know, just talking to people who've been in those situations and doing small, limited amounts of research or reading little articles about it um, or watching documentaries or whatever it is that we've been exposed to uh, as it relates to people who have been in those situations. Sometimes a person, somebody, you know, being a victim of sexual assault or molestation or something like that can cause them to have some weird issues intimately, right? Or just weird intimate issues, meaning they, just have random times when they don't want to be touched. We've had to counsel people with situations like that. Also, there's other clinical things and you know that people suffer from due to you know chemical imbalances, hormonal imbalances, and things like that, right? And they may very much love their spouse. Then you also have, you know, sometimes women in relationships go through a certain kind of trauma, right? Where the man may have been very abusive, or the man may have been caught lying, doing things to her, hurting her. Um, you know, when one of the things we know women, um, it's very difficult for women to, to, to get over is when they are deceived or they're lied to, or, you know, they feel like they've been living, the person that they with has been living a double life. Um, and for example, if a man marries a woman 
and he has another wife and he stays with this woman for years, has a family she doesn't know about, then the woman finds out. Or with these kind these different kinds of things, it doesn't have to be anything that's an outright sin. It could just be something that traumatizes the woman. When women go through that, they can love the person in general. They have a love for the person they meet, even to a certain extent, a part of them is still in love with the person. But whatever they experience in that relationship caused them to have, you know, some kind of emotional or hormonal imbalance, right? probably more emotional imbalance. And that could lead to, you know, lack of intimacy. You know, there's a bunch of different things that people can go through psychologically. Men, I don't really know too many men that, you know, that love their wife and they just have a problem with intimacy. Um, but, you know, those are some of the reasons. Also, we find people, you know, here in the West, a lot of times people, uh, you know, they, they, especially when the wife works, if you have a wife that, you know, she goes to work um, and she has to come home and deal with children, they got those weird situations like that. The woman, a lot of times she's burnt out. She's off balance, right? Um, hormonally, uh, physically, women, they, they're not like us. You know, they don't just, some of them at different, there's women sometimes in certain stages of their life where, you know, they just walk around and they're, they're ready to go. But a lot of times you'll find women, especially mothers, especially seasoned women, that their life is kind of monotonous. They don't always have that same, you know, upbeat, active sexual desire. It takes a little bit more. You know what I mean? You have to, you got to kind of work on it throughout the day to get it to that mood. For those people who, you know, sadly their women are working and doing things like that, going to school, trying to juggle, you know, full-time school, and they come home, you're dealing with the kids and the house and all that kind of stuff. Just from, you know, our experiences, you know, counseling and being involved in the community, that typically causes a problem um, with women. They get burnt out um, and they don't even know they're burnt out. And the husband can't figure out why is his wife not attracted to him. It's like when you first got married, was she attracted to you? Like, yeah, she was, you know, all over me. Okay, but what happened? Well, she started to work here or she started to, you know, go to school full time, trying to work on a master's degree and at the same time have twins or whatever. That stuff will burn the woman out and cause push a woman away. And also, last thing, another example, last example I want to give is that there are people who, um, and I noticed this is kind of, I'm not going to say it every country, and I don't want people from, um, who may be listening from abroad who may have their roots um, abroad. I don't want them to get offended, but this is not from me just making stuff up. This is from my experience, again, counseling, dealing with people. It seems to be somewhat trendy. Now, even if, I'm, even if it's just, you know, the, the overwhelming minority, it seems to be somewhat trendy that people... Um, in certain countries abroad, their view on intimacy is a little bit different than what we come from, or a lot different than what we come from in the West. You know, in the West, coming from a non-Muslim culture, even the people that were born Muslim and raised Muslim, if you were overly exposed to non-Muslim culture, you've been, you know, muta'asif and affected and influenced by non-Muslim culture. So you may have some of those traits. People from the West, at least when we were growing up, it's real sick and weird right now, but when we were growing up, we were, we remember, you know, liking girls and, and, and, you know, being lustful and wanting to get in relationships, you know, so we can be intimate, talk about intimacy, everything in the culture, right? It entices and incites a person into intimacy, uh, intimacy inside a person, right? That's just how we are. You know what I mean? When we look, when the when people from the West think about relationships, the first thing we think about is being intimate. There's nothing taboo about it. These kafar are completely and totally out of control. They're raunchy. They have no chill. They'll say anything. Look at how they live, like, you know, like animals, right? Many of them, sadly. Not all of them, but many of them. Why? Because the culture within itself, sex is everything but taboo. I noticed that people from abroad, like, for example, in some of the Muslim countries, because the, alhamdulillah, the presence of, of, of you know, uh, the preservation of chastity and, and shyness, and, um, you know, everything has to do with the preservation of the private parts because that's such a, uh, uh, an important thing. Um, and a lot of it, a lot of times we know has to do with, even with the Muslims who aren't educated, you know, and understand the necessity of, of safeguarding your private parts from a Shadi perspective. They, at the very least, <clears throat> don't want to compromise their chastity because they don't want to dishonor their family. Nonetheless, they take that very seriously. You know, historically, Muslim countries, have taken that very seriously. The sexes have been separated. And, and in some cultures, intimacy has become taboo. 
to such an extent that you have some women who, you know, they may have a horrible uh, sex life with their husband to the point where they're miserable and they're going to, they fall into depression and they have nobody to talk to. So they'll go to the email but, of the match and they complain. But, but in, that, in that scenario, would it be that sex is taboo <clears throat> or, or just talking about sex is taboo? Well, having, well, I should, I, rather I should say being miserable and unhappy because you're not having sex is taboo. Okay, we've been in situations where women wanted to get out of marriages because the sex was, you know, the husband wasn't that intimate. He didn't really, maybe he wasn't attracted to her, whatever reason he didn't. But like you mean his her. performance, his performance wasn't up to par. Well, not even the performance, like not necessarily the action itself. Like, let's say she would a climax or whatever. No, no, no, no. We mean like we've had multiple situations where women have come and they said, look, my husband is not touching me. He just, he's not interested. Now, whether it's because we've had some, we had a situation where women said the husband said that he, you know, he, he's just not that sexual. And it could have been because he wasn't attracted to her, whatever the reason was. The point is when the woman was, you know, um, when she was advised, we advised her, well, listen, if you, this is a problem for you, it's, and it can't get resolved, then you have a reason to get out of the marriage. And it's like, well, I can't go to my family with that. I have to come up with something better. If I tell my family that I, that being, I, that I'm, my husband doesn't want to be intimate with me and my desire is not getting satisfied they're going to look at me like something's wrong with me because they don't culturally they don't look at you know a woman being aroused as something that is a big deal even we've had her you know one account we had one account where a woman um actually went to her mother um because she said she really couldn't take it anymore she wanted she was like 30 years old something like that and she wanted to get married and her mother was like what's wrong with you like what kind are you a lewd woman and the woman, they were talking on a Muslim woman trying to, you know, obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, be a part of deen properly, everything she could do, she was trying to do, but she just was lonely. She wanted to be trying to get married. She wanted to have a regular life. And her mother looked at her like she was kind of crazy. And that wasn't the, the first time or the last time that we heard an example like that. So there are different reasons why people, you know, may not look at intimacy or have the same desire for intimacy that we have. We have many situations that we've heard where, you know, the wife is, she's a good wife. She may be kind. The husband doesn't have any problems with her. She treats him good, cooks his food. There's nothing disrespectful, you know, but for whatever reason, her desire for intimacy it could be due to her background, could be due to any of these reasons we mentioned and many other reasons, it's just not there. And for that reason, you know, it, it, it's not due to lack of love. It's just due to whatever the person may be going through medically, culturally, hormonally, or otherwise. And in the other cases when people just literally fall out of love with people, they're stuck, maybe they have a bunch of children or they have other things binding them, whatever the case, sometimes the women stay in marriages because they don't have anywhere else to go. They don't have any financial support. Whatever the reasons are, right? People are threatened if you leave and you get mad, I'm gonna take my children. Many reasons why people may stay together, be married, but because they're not in love, they're not being intimate, and you know, it, it, you know it, that's just their lifestyle. So you know, I think to answer your question in a nutshell, sometimes that's the case that people are not married or people are not being intimate due to um, lack of love, and sometimes they are in love. But there's other reasons that that come between them and prioritize the intimacy, and, and it could very well just be because they're not aroused or turned on for whatever reason. Now. I want to make it first and foremost to the, to the to the people that are that are viewing. The link for those that want to join the discussion, the link is in the live chat area. If you click click the link, you'll be put in what I refer to as a waiting area until it's uh, until we're until we start to admit people into the live discussion with their question or comment or concern or opinion on a matter and thus forth and so on. Uh, but the, the reality is that the link for that is in the live chat. Whoever decides to come in, we ask that you don't be too long winded. You shouldn't be speaking for 15 minutes straight. 15 minutes on the live stream is a lot is a long time. So we we want you to come in and express yourself. But we don't want you to, you know, to give us a sermon, basically. That's one. But then, two, when looking at this particular situation, and looking at other cultures, um, first and foremost, I know we, uh, there's a lot of different, a lot of people that that view heavyweight dialogue whatever, that may have different ethnic backgrounds. 
culturally speaking here in the U.S., it's not unheard of to speak about subjects of, of this matter. In fact, culturally speaking, when coming up, it doesn't happen too often now, but I when, when I was a child, uh, at some point, your father, if you're a son, and your mother, if you're a girl, are going to give you a talk about the birds and the bees. That was what it was referred to. And that's basically a talk, uh, you know, about uh, sexual matters and sexual education and things of that nature. So I know when it comes to other cultures, this may not be the case. This may not be the case. But in Western culture, it's not unheard of, or at least in American culture, it's not unheard of to have some type of discussion concerning this. Of course, in, in, a, in a moral way, not in an immoral way, but in a moral way, you know, because what is important is that lessons are taken away from this from the discussion in order for a person to take that information and to be a source of benefit for them. So one, I want to go back to something that Ismail was referring to. Yes, it's, it's when it comes to uh, sexless marriages, the reasons could vary. They differ. They vary and differ. And as a result of what the reason may be, it could determine if love is still there or love is gone. Now, a lot of times when this discussion is talked about, people usually assume, if you say sexless marriage, they usually assume marital discord. And a sexless marriage may not be the result of marital discord. You know, and a lot of times, you know, although we do have that, although that is a reason why some sexless marriages take place. Uh, maybe a sister may have this understanding like women prior to Islam, you know, uh, where they're, they're using their body as a means to uh, leverage. They're leveraging their body in order to get something. And if they don't get it, then there's a problem. You know, they may come, you know, you may have some people come in with that mentality. Uh, but generally speaking, marital discord is not the only reasons for uh, sexless marriages. There, there are some, some examples, like, for instance, when having children, especially if you have an, one child after another and one child after another, this could be a reason for a sexless marriage, especially if the children are, are, are at an age where they're really dependent upon the mother, really, really? Uh, as That's some people say, real needy. I hear an echo. Somebody's volume needs to be turned down. All right. So, alaikum. I, I just uh, wanted to throw something in because as I listen to you repeat the question to Ustad Ismail, uh, I, I kind of feel like me, myself, personally, I missed the mark on the question. Yeah, you didn't. You didn't uh, <laughs> about <laughs> you know, love. It, it what, what, what, you add, what, you add, what you added to the discussion was good. Well, yeah, <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. Yeah. So I just wanted to hit on the point of love and sex. I knew he was going to catch that. Too. I knew he was going to yeah. catch it. I caught it when I heard the question again. <laughs> Right, right, you know, I'm getting up there, so you got to be patient. <laughs> you know. So, love and sex. Loving is an emotion, and sex is a desire. And we know that people can be in love without having sex, just like people can have sex without being in love. Mm -hmm. And this is very important to understand that... And this is my personal opinion when it comes to love. I feel that love is an emotion that's inspired by being intrigued due to statements, actions, or physical and intangible qualities of the beloved. And as long as those things exist, love will exist. And of course, in Islam, those things exist and cause a person to 
enter into a marriage contract. So this is before intercourse. Mm -hmm. So if a person loved the person before sex, then sex should not affect that love remaining. It could increase it. But it should not, if sex wasn't a reason, and, and, and, and, and you know, of, uh, for the love taking place. Now, if the person married based on compatibility without necessarily loving that individual, let's say it was a very short engagement, khitbah, qasira, it was a very short engagement. So they got married, and neither one of them loved one another. And then sex was the key reason of the person falling in love. Because sometimes people love people, and sometimes people love what the people do. So a person could fall in love with their spouse's sexual performance, and that would be the main reason for loving their spouse. Point that I'm making is that whatever caused the love, if it remains, the love remains. And if it doesn't remain, the love goes with it. So if the love of a spouse is connected to their intimate, their performance in intimacy, then this is when the lack of intimacy is going to affect the love. And if loving the spouse had nothing to do with intimacy, then intimacy won't affect the love of the spouse. Wallahu a'ala wa'ala. Yeah, barakallahu khayyik. Wa about yeah, so I, I, I just wanted to go through, like I was saying, some of the uh, the reasons why a marriage may become sexless, uh, so that so that we're we're on a, a understanding as we move forward with the discussion. So we were stating that one, it could simply be a, a woman having child after child, and those children are at an age where they need their mother. And they they constantly need their mother, and so if you especially when you have a man that's working between work and you know him going to work coming home, uh, and with her dealing with the children after he comes home and thus far for so on, it it just may a a, a a day may slip into a week, a week may slip into a month, and next thing you know time is flying by, and there is little to no sex in the relationship. This is something that's very possible, uh, and this is something that is occurring. Another scenario would be uh, if the, if a man works a lot, especially like as our brother Ismail uh, in, in some of the other episodes of Heavyweight Dialogue when we talked about the type of money a person should be earning to be able to uh, afford polygyny, uh, our brother Ismail advocated for a person making $100,000 or more. Well, you know, a $100,000 earner is usually a person that's working at the very least around 60 hours a week. That's not a, that's not, you, you won't find a person making $100,000 being a 40, a 40 hour a week, a 40 hour working a week type person, right? you find them working more hours than 40 hours in the work week. And so as a result of that, because a person is constantly working, then, you know, he may not have time to be intimate with his spouse. Or you may have a situation where the, both the husband and the wife works. And although we hear about what is, uh, what people would prefer as it relates to husband working, making making enough money to come home, provide for the entire family, it is common that you find Muslim mar uh, both husband and wife in in uh, in, in uh, Muslim marriages. You find them working. the the The husband has his job and or career, and likewise, the wife may have her job and or career. Not every situation is like that, but there are plenty of situations like that. And as a result, the, the work schedules conflict. He's coming home, she's going out or vice versa or whatever the case may be. And it causes the marriage to be either semi-sexless or low sex, a low sex marriage, or in some cases, a sexless marriage. Uh, you can have a situation like we stated marital discord 
the mar marital discord. Uh, because that marital, when, when there's marital discord in the home, uh, there's there's a, a there's an atmosphere of animosity, an atmosphere of uh, frustration, and and and that's for for so on, for lack of better uh, expressions. Then you can have a situation. This is, these are situations where I think it is difficult for people to talk about, where sex may just be unpleasurable to one of the spouses. Uh, you have some, you, you may have a man that's really well endowed and um, because he's real well endowed, uh, the, the way that he uh, moves, for lack of better expressions, while having intercourse may be painful or may not be pleasurable to the woman. In this society, you find women complaining about that, where where it feels like they're being uh, uh, penetrated, accosted. Uh -huh. accosted. Feel like they're being exactly. accosted. Exactly. No. Exactly. Um, and so, so it's just not pleasurable to them. Or on the other end, uh, the the man may not feel like it's pleasurable to him. Uh, the man may not feel like it's pleasurable to to, to him. Um, for for lack of better expressions, he may feel like it's it's loose, you know. So it, so you know he he's not. It, it's unpleasurable to him. And so these are things that you know. These are some of the reasons that can cause a lack of enthusiasm or. It, that could cause that could be a means to a sexless or a low sex or semi semi sexless marriage, and so when looking at these particular reasons, then these reasons can be the determining factor as it relates to love, uh, uh, uh, loveless or lack of love type situation taking place or not, and a lot to what I tell and those best. Well, well, can we um? Can we, uh, could, could I chime in on the first reason that you mentioned, which was the work schedule? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, a couple... Yeah, like a brother, a, a brother in the comments section says, also the sex can become plain or boring. Which plain and boring. Plain or boring. Right, right. Okay. Uh, and, and that right there, that specific comment about uh, uh, uh could be due to cultural differences with yeah. the world being a melting pot and then, and then like the reference that was made to the I thought of Umar earlier cultural mm -hmm. differences could cause that it could be blank, plain and boring for one individual and uh, the other uh, individual be due to co cultural pra cultural norms could be considered demeaning and degrading yeah, yeah. That which excites one person could be degrading to another individual, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. is very, very important topic, and like that, and and and um. But you know, going to the the issue of the earning, the mm -hmm. uh, the spouse is working or one of the spouses working, and that is what's causing the break. Well, first, is that lack bothering one or both parties? Well, I would imagine usually on the males in, I, I can't speak for the women, but I, I would imagine on the males in, it's going to cause some type of frustration. I can't hear you. On a man's end, it's going to cause some type of frustration. Let me ask you a well, question. You know, you know I, I, I, but I'm sorry. You do you have a, do you have a feed open? Um, I'm hearing an echo. All right. Hearing echo. You hear an echo. Are you, you listening? Are you listening to the uh, live stream with the volume? Listening to the live stream with the volume. Am I listening? Well, the brother yeah, was. You have, you have, it. A, you have a page, a page open with the YouTube streaming. Yeah. Close that. Yeah. Turn the, turn the volume down on that. Okay. Can you hear it now? One two one two. One two one two. Not still hear the echo. Not still hear the echo. 
if you have a if you have if you have a, if you have the if you have the actual YouTube open the page open and streaming, all you have to do is turn the volume down. No, I'm coming from Streamyard. That's what I'm on. And Abdul Aziz, he was on. Uh, Uh, he was on YouTube. He's no longer you no longer on YouTube. He's no longer on YouTube. No. Okay. Okay. Huh, I wonder where that echo is coming from. Yeah, I, see, I don't I see, hear. I, I, I don't see, hear an echo. Let me see. Okay, I hear it on my end, but maybe. You know, my my my phone was uh my phone was acting up earlier, so maybe you guys don't hear it. Because uh, I I know it's not coming from Ismael because Ismael is muted. Right. Be coming from him. Okay, I'm going to mute myself and see if you still hear the echo. One, two, one, two. No, I don't hear the echo now. Okay, the brother, he's totally closed out of everything. Okay. Well, our best, inshallah. We'll, we'll, you know, I don't have time to figure that out. Okay. So, um, I don't know if you want to take this question first as, as the sister she has down here, what is the advice on having the discussion about this topic prior to marriage, how should it be approached? You want to handle that? No question. Sure, no problem. <laughs> um, that's definitely something that should be discussed, but it should be it should be discussed with taste, right? It should be discussed uh, in concept and not reality. Uh, we come from a society where they say what? Keeping it real, keeping it 100 and all of that. And this, these are phrases used to be vulgar or to be brash or to be callous in the way we speak. But the Prophet wasallam said, and then haya iman, that shyness is a branch of faith. And at the same time, he said, Inna Allah la yastahi min al -haq. He said, and Allah is not shy of the truth. So now, how do we take these two texts that are not contradictory? One says shyness is a branch of faith, and the one says Allah is not shy of the truth. So it means that we deal with the truth tactfully. And when it comes to very delicate issues, we discuss them in concept but not in reality, meaning we don't need to get into the gory details or the very touchy details of it, but in concept, we say, okay, um, is uh, the, the, the sister or the brother, do they feel that they have high desires or their desire, desires are between high and low, or do they have low desires? But let, let's let's let's let's put the scenario because in, in reality, let's say for instance, because I, I, this is why I believe I, I can't hear you. You can't hear me. Now, now, go ahead. Yeah, uh, what I was saying is, let's let's look at varying scenarios because that with that particular statement you were making, if we're dealing with two young people who are both virgins. Will they be able to actually gauge themselves like that? Definitely. Um, and I'll give you an example. Me in my personal situation, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, mashallah, I have, uh, you know, daughters have grown and who have married. And I had a personal practice that I used to have with my daughters. And I still practice it with my younger daughters. Mm -hmm. And while they were growing up, I would joke with my daughters and say to them, Oh, you're getting older. You're going to get married. The man is going to take you away. You're going to go away from me. And my daughters would say, Abby, don't say that. El, don't say that. Ech, ech, we're not going off. We're going to stay with you forever. And that's what they would say. And I would say that maybe every year, every two years. Oh, you're going to get married. You're going to grow up. Some man is going to take you off. They say, Ech, Abby, don't say that. No, we're going to be with you forever. We're not going to go off with, with any man. And then... One by one, each daughter got to a stage where I would say, oh, you're going to get married. The man is going to take you off. And then she would remain silent. Hmm. No more ich. No more. <laughs> no more stay with you forever. No more. Right? So hmm. that's a sign. And then I would say to my wife at that point, 
is it time to have the talk? And she would say to me, yes, it's time to have the talk. And it means that those two were conversing about the new stage that that particular daughter had entered into, meaning her desires had awakened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she was ready to, for me to do my job and start searching for a partner like that. Um, also, may seem like a touchy topic, but also, as parents, and we talk, when you mention virgins, normally we're going to be talking about children you know, uh, or young adults. So mm -hmm. also, if the parents are doing their job when it comes to uh, watching and, and, and watching the growth and the changes in their children and their hormones and in their maturity, they look for the presence of uh, it's the not. They look for the presence of masturbation. Mm -hmm. That's an indication of the strength of this, the desires of a virgin. So yeah. if you have a virgin mm -hmm. child, male or female, and they're falling into things, things like this, okay, mm -hmm. uh, then this is also a sign of the strength of their desires. And then at that point, the father, and this is just my advice, I'm not saying it's permissible or, or obligatory, but the father takes his male child to the, to the side and asks him about the strength of his desires. How, how often do you think about girls and how strong is it? Do you fear for yourself? Do you fear? And like that, this is a gauge for mm -hmm. the desire. Likewise, uh, the, the, the mother asked the daughter, okay, how often, if they fall into masturbation, how often do you touch yourself? I'm not asking you to reveal your sins, but how often do you have the desire to touch yourself? Let's put it like that. You know, mm -hmm. is it every day? Is it every other day? Is it sometimes and like that? So this is the stage to gauge the strength of the desires. And then after that, after the actual intimacy takes place, then this becomes the job of each spouse mm -hmm. to, to know what is sufficient for their significant other uh, and what's not sufficient for their significant other. Yeah, Barak al and see, see and it's like I said, discussions like that like when, when we're dealing with different cultures, I believe some cultures it'll be a taboo, uh, and Allah knows best. No. Uh, but in our culture, those types of scenarios and situations are not. It's just, it's just, it's, it's not done distastefully, of course. But um, this is like I said, you know, uh, when I was coming up, we had the term, you know, talking about the birds and the bees. No. No. No. Now, our brother Ismail, he's playing um, Salat al Isha at the moment. But I want to. Uh, uh, what about the other issues you mentioned after that? You mentioned the working yeah, of the spouses. Uh, the, you said the spouse is working. Mm -hmm. uh, you yeah. mentioned intercourse not being pleasurable. Marital discord, marital discord, uh, and uh, yeah, and, and, and sexual relations being unpleasurable. Right. So now, if we talk about the scheduling, that's going to go back to what is most important between the spouses, because some marriages, especially for uh, people that have high financial goals, mm -hmm. uh, intercourse is secondary for those types of couples. If, I don't know if you've ever counseled those type of types of couples, especially when it's one sided. No, that, I, don't do, I, don't do, I don't deal with too much counseling. Oh, okay, okay. Now, so I, I've, I've, I've, I've dealt with those six figure couples before. And a lot of times, one of them uh, is saying to the other, we'll get back to that right now, as they say the slang today. Uh, mm -hmm. We got to get the bag. So yeah. sex will be there. But these opportunities to get the money won't. So this is a justification of not you know, paying attention to the desires of the other spouse uh, uh, and, and like that. And, and we know that when it comes to uh, marriage in general, normally marriages break down for one or two reasons. Intimacy and finances. These are the main yeah. breakdowns. For relationships in general, marriage is specific. If, if, if you see a, a, a relationship break down, normally it's either intimacy or finances, you know, and like that. So, and it may be cloaked in many other excuses, but if you get down uh, uh, to the core, 
issue is going to fall into one of the, one of the two. So what will have to be investigated when it is the, the six-figure money chasers, how important is intimacy, especially for a woman? Because for many women who still have their fitra intact, which, which are few, to many women who really have their nature intact, she wants to be a mother and she don't, doesn't want to be an old mother. So pushing marriage off in order to chase finances is like, in the beginning, it sounds good. When she's promised the gifts and the home and the vehicle and the vacation, it seems tempting. But then as she begins to get older and she realized that the, the, the, the, the, the responsibility of carrying a baby and what that's going to do to her body and the changes, you know, uh, is going to do in her, you know, in her hormones and in, in, in her uh, uh, uh, emotions and her psyche, then she becomes, the, the bag be, begins to be less tempting. And a mother to actually hold a child in her arms, to actually feed a child from her breast, this becomes more important. To to to the pinnacle of, of, of womanhood is to be a mother. So now that being stripped away, to the point, and you know, uh, in the book of Nikah and in and, and, and Sahih Muslim, where the Prophet Sallallahu explained that a man cannot practice coitus interruptus. He cannot practice coitus interruptus except with his wife's permission because the right of childbearing is her. So he cannot uh, deprive her, uh, and, and to the point that he even said that it's, it's your indirect way of burying your children alive. The prophet mm. compared men, uh, and coitus interruptus, for those who don't know, is when a man um, retracts himself from his wife before the, the, the world, reaching the his climax. The, the Western cultural way would to say it would be he pulls out. Right. Yeah. So, so, yeah, so pulling out. So a man doing this, uh, this cannot be done without, except, except with the permission of the wife. You know? So, so, so we look at this, this, this practice because this is one of the highest, after chastity, the highest... Uh, uh, uh, uh, Fulfillment of the coming of the spouse together intimately is what? Is to produce offspring. Right? So you have first chastity. That's number one. After chastity is producing offspring. So now, delaying this for the man is no problem. But for the woman, it's detrimental because her body is on a clock. Right. Her body's on a clock. She's not going to always be able to produce. And even if she's able to reproduce, she's not always able to physically handle that responsibility. So that is more dangerous for the woman. The second one you mentioned was marital discord. Now we know as uh, Ustad Ismail was mentioning Ustad Najib, we know in this culture, because I, you've referred several times back to American culture, mm -hmm. marital discord, now you can speak on, on, on uh, mashallah, your, your experiences, but for me, honestly, marital discord is not really a reason in this culture for the lack of intimacy. As a matter of fact, it may be a reason for because of the strange uh, culture we have. <laughs> it may be a reason that causes intimacy. You know, for those who are, uh, for those who uh, intimacy is based upon um emotion and desire but you do have a class of people clinically defined as sapiosexual who cannot perform males and females sapiosexual mm -hmm. someone who's drawn intellectually that they cannot uh, physically desire someone until there's an intellectual connection so when you have that element this is what our discord will cause a break in, in intimacy, but people that are, are, are you know normally drawn through physics, physical in emotion, a lot of times marital discord. They will say, and I'm sure you may counsel situations like this or her situations like this, where oh no, it's the you know, uh, intimacy is even better when there's some anger or something going on. You know, they uh, today they call it what toxic, right? Uh, or or back in the day, where people you know, make up, make up sex. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. The break up to make up type huh? stuff. 
Make up sex. You still there, huh? What? I, yeah, I didn't hear it. the last statement. What did you say? No, the breakup to make up type stuff. Make up type yeah, stuff. yeah, exactly. So that's widespread. That's widespread to the point that those who don't except that scenario are looked at as being strange. You know? And, and like that. So uh, uh, in our society, um, th that, that part, I believe, honestly, discord uh, is, uh, discord meaning it's, it just being uh, misunderstanding is rare unless that discord, like I said before earlier, is, is based on finance. Then that is an issue. The pressure of the pressure of financial, uh, the financial pressures could actually cause a man not to be able to perform. Yeah. And yeah. emotional pressure, meaning the woman not being not believing that her husband is attracted to her, right, could cause her not to perform. So I think when it comes to those issues. The financial stress for a male would prevent him from the performing, even though he has the physical ability, and the uh, the emotional pressures that a woman not feeling loved or not feeling that she's attractive to her spouse would cause her not to be able to perform or perform properly. Uh, wallahu a'la wa a'la. Now I see that the brother uh, Abdul Khabir. That's in the waiting room, waiting to come in. I'm going to add him to the screen to see uh, if he has a question, comment, concern, or something to add to the discussion. Abdul Khabir, uh, you need to unmute yourself. Naam. Salaamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Salaamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. No, nothing, nothing uh, to add. Just here to listen. Just to listen, I say you can go to the live stream directly on the Pure Slimes channel. That the link that you hit is for people that wanted to come in and add a uh, either with a question or a comment, concern, and like this. So I'm okay, I see. This. Okay. Okay. Barakallahu feek. Feek barakallahu. Yeah. So. Moving on to the next question concerning the topic, and this is uh, as it relates to the man. And we know the question I'm going to ask, I think that a lot of times when there may be a, sex, a sexless marriage and a man is feeling frustrated or however he may be feeling from not get, having sex, and this is where this question comes into play. Should a man acquire another wife while dealing with a sexless marriage. And I, let's say, for instance, uh, yeah, so could a man acquire another wife while dealing with a sexless marriage? Um, who? who, who? Let's let, I'll, I'll let it know you'll take it. He's coming back in. I mean, both of you, both of you brothers could, can touch on the topic, but we'll pass him back to Mario for a second and get his input, inshallah. Please. Um, well, as Sheikh Abdul Rahman ibn Nasir Sa'idi rahimahullah, he mentioned in his tafsir um, that that's one of the reasons why a man should get another wife, is if his desire for intimacy is more than his wife, or if he has two wives or three wives whatever number of wives he has if he didn't get to four yet specifically i guess in this case one if his desire is too much for that one and he has the ability then you know it it, it, it would be more appropriate for him to get another wife um but that statement as real and as accurate as the sheikh was when he made that statement the brothers have to put it into a proper context because just because you get another wife 
and you're intimate now, maybe let's just say, for example, you get another wife and you should give you, you know, the intimacy between the two of you um, is, you know, is good, it's consistent. You're no longer in a sexless marriage because you have a new wife, but you're still in a sexless marriage, still in a sexless marriage because you have to be equal with your time. And so when you're at your other wife or with your other wife and it's her night and it's sexless, you still have the same problem. Now you do have a sense of relief and your uh, ability to protect yourself and the chances of you protecting yourself from anything lewd or from, you know, um, staring at things you shouldn't stare at or whatever stress and complications may come as a result of, you know, lack of intimacy you still have a problem on your hands and not only that and again i'm not i am in total agreement with the sheikh i'm just you know sharing something with the brothers that we all have to take into consideration if a person now goes and takes on another wife and this other problem with the first wife still exists and it's not being treated it's not being rectified um it's not being you know uh, that problem is not being solved now you added unintentionally a, an additional problem which is in, in, in, uh, intense how can i put it an increased amount of insecurity because this wife now is going to know or assume even um that you are being satisfied intimately from your new wife and she's not this first one is it now if it's due to some foolishness okay and I don't say that it's you know out of instant uh, what's the word uh, insensitivity, but there are some cases, and I believe Najib mentioned one example when you know you have some women with a mind frame that you know I'm they're gonna hold out and and and shut themselves off as a means of disciplining or taking a stance against the husband, but not even to that extent. Just a woman who maybe she experienced some type something in the relationship that bothered her. You know, again, maybe the husband took on a wife, didn't tell her, or maybe, um, you know, um, there was some finances that took place between the two of them, or maybe you have a lot of cases, people have marital problems because they're stepchildren in the case and the wife doesn't think that, you know, the husband is treating her children justly or the, the husband doesn't think that his new wife is treating his children from the pre-existing marriage justly or whatever the case is, things that like reoccurring problems that kind of turn the woman off you know and, and make and you know, she gets cold now a man can easily if she's a religious woman a man can come to her and say okay well you know you have to be intimate with me because you know allah said this and the prophet allah said, said that you know we have things in our religion that make it obligatory upon you to be intimate with me when i call you but nobody and i don't know any man who's really into women who's going to find pleasure and being intimate with somebody who you can tell that that person doesn't want to be intimate with them. You know what I mean? When somebody doesn't want to be intimate back, it's eternal. You know what I mean? Especially from our culture. You know, we don't got even got to get into it, but it's like, I'm not even interested. If you're not interested, you know what I mean? Well, I'm not definitely not interested. That's a major turn off. Part of uh, attraction is that you know somebody's attracted to you. You're attra a lot of times our attraction or interest in a person is increased because we know that they're attracted to us or they're interested in us, right? Um, so if a man knows that his wife, for, for, for whatever reason, she has a problem with him or she's upset with him about something he may have done, she's walking around chilling on the shoulder and she can't get past it, but they're still married, right? They're still married. The other aspects of the relationship are still functioning, but she's upset with him and she's emotionally, you know, uh, perplexed. That man now, he may lose interest in being with her uh, intimately or trying to, you know, get arouse her or, get her to that point. And because she's angry with him, she's not making any advancement. So now this nonetheless, it still leads to a sexist marriage. He goes and gets another wife or two or three, or whatever, he gets another wife. When he gets that other wife, the problem with the first wife exists and sometimes it increases even more because she's already mad at him. Now she's jealous. Now her emotions are all over the place. And you know, if she's not rational enough to understand that, listen, you're a Muslim woman, there's a legislation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed to you. And, you know, as a Muslim woman, you have to function a particular way. Making yourself miserable, holding grudges, 
where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Fasfah, Safhan Jameena, right? When you're going to pardon, pardon, pardon in a way that's beautiful, you have to get over it, you have to move forward, and so on and so forth. If she doesn't do that, she can walk around with a grudge, with the grudge she already had, now a new grudge. So by him taking on another wife can add a bigger problem. So I think if, you know, to answer the question, it all depends. Men taking on another wife, like in, in general, in general, and again, I agree with the sheikh, but in general, men taking on another wife should not be because um, he thinks he's going to solve the problem of a sexless marriage. But you take on another wife because you know, this is closer to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala established our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam upon because of the overall benefit, because it's going to help him uh, naturally, without a doubt, um, lower his gaze and, and guard his chastity and so on and so forth. But he should not think that I'm going to get another wife and now, bam, the problem solved. Except for the case when you have a wife who, you know, her level of intimacy may not be that high. Not for any specific reasons, just because she's maybe a little overwhelmed, a little busy with the children. She's just not, you know, in feeling like her normal self. And then he gets right. another wife. Now she gets com- now she gets competitive. That's probably going to be the only benefit. For- benefit. But in general, I think that, you know, it can help the man, but it could also open the door to a different kind of complication. But even if the sister, even if the sister does have a low sex drive, um, in a situation in a scenario like that, um, and, and the husband has more of a thirst for sexual relations, then in a situ- scenario like that, I don't think it's going to bring about a big problem. The problem that will come in is the scenario where, for whatever reason, the man is withholding relation, withholding having sexual relations w- with with the, with his wife. And the yeah. wife, is, the wife is wanting, you know, relations, and she's not getting it, you know. So, uh, in a situation in a scenario like that, that may be, and Allah knows best, foolish for the man to to to to to, to acquire another wife while he has that problem, whatever the problem is in his home that's preventing him from coming to his his wife, and uh, and fulfilling her needs. You know, that type, no, of, no, that type of situation is just going to cause some Another some kind friction. of problem. Yeah, it's going to yeah, cause yeah. Some- No, def- def- definitely. I was talking more on the lines of a woman who she herself, for whatever reason, is not really, you know, if, if a woman just has, a, let's say, for example, a low sex drive, or it's just like mm-hmm. it can't meet her husband, that's a different story. But I'm talking more about an actual sexless marriage when a man and a woman are not being intimate. Right, where or it's just so low that it's really ridiculous. Or the woman, her attitude towards, you know, uh, intimacy with her husband, he can pick up that she's really not into it. A scenario mm-hmm. like that, whatever, if if it's if her reasons are due to just some natural reasons, that's one thing. But if it's due to some marital discord because she has trust issues or because he hurt her and those wounds hadn't healed yet, or whatever the case, if it's emotional and it's anger. There's always different kinds of things mixed up. And then he does it. Yeah, he definitely is going to, inshallah, have some more intimacy from the new wife. And that will definitely, inshallah, help him with his appetite, sexually, and so on and so forth. But it's not going to necessarily solve the problem with the other wife who he has to spend half his time with. You know what I mean? So he'll come off in one aspect. But her reasons um, um, for lack of intimacy is due to some anger or some grudge or some emotional issue that she developed as a result of some problems between them, I think he can open another door to a problem. So he's still going to have to rectify that situation with the first wife in order to, uh, you know, to um, be at peace. Plus, if it's all about intimacy and you, you want to increase in intimacy and enjoy yourself, why are you going? You need the, both of them to be active and moving, and and and and you know what I'm saying for things to really work out the way you need them to work out. You like I'm paying the amount of bills for two, three, four women, and I'm only been intimate with one or two. No, no, no, no, no, no, no, no, no, no, no. I mean, the way I look at it, uh, it has to be a case study. Mm. You know, it's like uh, when Sheikh Ibn Uthaymin, rahimahullah ta'ala, he was asked mm. no. about a man that had some discord from his wife, but he wanted to keep her. He mm-hmm. said, he asked Sheikh Ibn Uthaymin, and, uh, is it permissible for a man to take another wife because he's having problems with his current wife? 
Okay. Sheikh Ibn Uthameen, rahimahullah, said, أَحْيَانًا لَا يُسْلِحْ الْمَرْأَةِ إِلَّا وُجُودِ إِمْرَارِ أُخْرَى Sometimes <laughs> nothing... <laughs> Sometimes nothing corrects a woman but the presence of another woman. And as they say, those who are into racing, and I'm not comparing the women, you know, these are the, we're living in the days of disclaimers, so I'm not comparing the women to animals, but they say that a racehorse doesn't run until you put another horse on the track. <laughs> right? So sometimes a woman in a happy, in a happy marriage, she has an ideal marriage, she can become complacent. Mm. complacent and I've warned brothers I've warned brothers because I'm I'm an advocate of polygyny I've warned brothers of having one wife for too long to the point that the woman begins to believe that it's her right to be the only wife and she begins to look at the man getting another wife without any issues as wow. betrayal That's another right. conversation likewise this even happens with children for, for parents who space their children apart too much Another child comes, and they are, as you know, totally the child that's there. Is, what, what I was there, that, all of my attention. So it even happens with children. But, but back to the topic. Back to the topic. In reality, um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm, I, I, when uh, Ustaz Najib gave his introduction, he mentioned what you know the the the goal to hold marriage together, and I'm, I'm with. Uh, him in concept, but not, but not in reality. I am not an advocate of keeping marriages together. I'm, a, I'm an advocate of keeping healthy marriages together. <laughs> there are people I believe should separate, and they should not make babies together because they have such an evil situation. And to remain together when it is clear that see, see the thing is, instance, I just asked my daughters this last week. Um. People going into a marriage has to understand what are your principles and what are your perspectives. Because if two people disagree in principle, they are not compatible. Spouses, business partners, friends, whatever. If two people not agree in principle, if they don't have the same principles, that's incompatibility they need to separate. Now, if they disagree in perspective, in many marriages, you will see the people will make concessions on their principles and then leave the marriage based on perspective, wow. which is strange. It's very strange. A woman wow. will say, OK, I understand the brother doesn't have a job. I have my oh, this is principle now. This is this is the, the, the, the institution of law set up. The man should be the provider. She will give up her right to provisions and then leave the marriage due to him taking another wife while providing. So she gave up principle and then left the marriage because of perspective. This is strange. This is a strange dynamic that we live in. So first of all, each party should know their principles, the difference between their principles. That, as they say in modern language, deal breakers. They should know their principles that are actually principles that are these are things that life depends on, that sanity depends on, that emotional stability depend on. And they should not, no matter how beautiful the sister is, no matter how handsome the brother is, no matter whatever the, you know, the, uh, the decoration is around this individual, if they are not compatible with you in principle, you're not going to work out. Now, let's go into perspective. Let's go into perspective. Now, if they disagree with you on strong perspective, this is where you make your concessions. You make your concessions on perspective. On perspective, uh, one of my daughters, I, I believe she mentioned that uh, one of her perspectives was that she would like, but it's not a must, that the individual is, uh, he has anaka, that he's, you know, he's a good dresser. <laughs> But if there wasn't present, that wouldn't be a deal breaker, but she would prefer, you know, an individual who knows how to dress. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> right? But in some strange situations that have counseled, this comes out in anger 
when this couple is about to separate, and he's a bum. He doesn't even know how to look at the shoes. What is what is going on? <laughs> this, like, how is this in a, you know in a conversation? So a man taking another wife to get back to the point. I believe that if the woman, because this is like we said before, this is a right a obligation upon her as service. So it, it's it's equivalent to the man not feeding her. So if a woman refuses to share the bed, we already know the text that the, the angels curse her. That this woman should not be kept, period. This woman should be released. This woman should be released. That she has the, if she has the ability, there's nothing physically, psychologically, preventing her from performing her duties to her husband, except an attitude that she chooses to have because something he did that she doesn't like then at this point, this woman should be released. This is not a woman that should be kept. Because she is now playing with the chastity of this man. And as Usted Ismail mentioned, getting another wife at this point is pointless because it, it, it, it, it, it, it, um, it opposes the point of having multiple wives. Because one of the benefits of multiple wives is having multiple channels of chastity. So now you still have a channel of chastity Shut down. So what's the benefit? What's the purpose? But you're still fulfilling those responsibilities. So one or two things, and sisters need to understand this, one or two things happen when a woman refuses to share the bed and the man has a choice. Either she loses her right to her nights and her, and her, her, her maintenance, or she loses her right to be a wife. It's, it's up to him. Mm -hmm. He can keep her while refusing to provide for her, and, and refusing, she doesn't have right to nights anymore. You know? Mm. So he can either discipline her through that way, or he can discipline her through allowing her to taste the bitterness of separation, or the idda, at least, in which she should have some time to get her head together and realize, oh, wait a minute. But this is very dangerous in Islam for a woman to refuse to share the bed with her husband. It's very dangerous. Mm. And it's not from, this is not from the uh, uh, choices that a woman has to make and I know it may sound bitter it may sound harsh, it may sound chauvinistic based on this society but no uh, you know, uh, a woman does not have the choice, the liberty of choosing whether or not to be intimate with her husband her being intimate with her husband is, is all his choice when he needs it unless she has a valid excuse to deny him and then at that point the husband, you know, uh, uh, observes, you know, sensitivity and, and, and, and, and respects that uh, uh, uh, because Allah Ta'ala said in Surah Al-Taghabun, Allah Fear Allah according to your ability. But a woman who, this is her pattern. This is what she does because, let's look at this ayat in Surah Al-Nisa. Very important because we've been brainwashed as men the other way around. Allah Ta'ala said, Allah said, those women that you fear for them from them discord, then, then admonish them. Then he said, Then he said, refuse to be intimate with them. I grew up believing and being taught, and I hear this from my peers, my elders and those who are younger than me, that the issue of intimacy is something that is controlled by the woman and that the men are the weak link when it comes to intimacy. And that, uh, you know, and they explain that this is from the reason of polygyny, that men need intercourse more than women and, and, like, and like that. Some of it is true, right? However, the, the issue of the men being the weak link, let's look into this ayah, if intimacy wasn't heavy or serious or important to the women, then refusing to be intimate would not be a way. Al-Hakim, right. subhanahu wa ta'ala, made from the ways of disciplining our women is to refuse to be intimate with them. So it means that this, isn't, this the apparatus is controlled by us. Or right. it, it would be, if a man couldn't do it, it would be impossible to dis. Uh, it would. It wouldn't be hashalillah. It wouldn't be even wise for this to be a means of a man to discipline his wife. 
because he can't resist. So now, when men step back, and, and, and us as Muslim men, and we push away this Western concept that we are just always in heat, and the women are always in control, and the women don't necessarily need it, we're the ones so needy of intercourse and like this and like that, then once we push away from that, we would see that we control that dynamic. And that we are able to actually go without it because if not, it would not be, reiterating, it would not be a means of disciplining the woman to refuse intercourse with her. So we have to get back to our original uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, status when it comes to desiring women and desiring intercourse that in reality we have more control than we think. We have more control than we think. So the woman who refuses to share the bed uh, and, and Ustad Ismail, he mentioned some important points. If she has these grudges and this anger toward her husband, at this point, this is when a woman needs to get a khula so that she doesn't fall into sin. This is, this is right now, we have reached, uh, have a firaq on bayni wa bayni, like, like uh, Khadda told Musa. This yeah. is uh, where we separate. Because I know, once the, a marriage reaches a point, that the fundamentals, the principles of marriage are not being uphold, upheld. Good treatment, provisions, intimacy, which, which, which the, the goal of intimacy is chastity. When these three and other principles that uphold the very fabric of the marriage bond, when they are being abandoned intentionally, this, this couple now needs to make istikhara and either give one another the rights that Allah has prescribed for each of them, or separate in kindness. Wallahu a'la wa a'la. Barakallahu So, so the question would be then, what can couples do to bring the passion back? Now, I understand that there is no one, one quick fix answer to this question, only because the circumstances and the situations differ. Uh, as it relates to the sexless marriages. But in general, what can couples do to bring the, the passion back? Because the point of, one of the points of Huggway Dialogue is listening to the people and getting them in, in a room where they can express themselves as it relates to whatever issues they may have with them and get some, and find some valid solutions to whatever issues or problems that they're faced with. So how, what can couples do to bring the passion back? Um, uh, when, well, first we would look into how the passion is lost. Because in order to fix any problem, you have to look at where it came from. So however the passion was lost is the way... You know, you look into that uh, uh, channel, and then you, in many cases, you have to reverse it. So if it was lost, let's say, for instance, through, and, and I don't want to mention anything extreme. Uh, let's say it was lost through, uh, as our brother Sharif uh, uh, mentioned earlier, through boredom. Through boredom. So the spouses are now bored in their intimacy. Then they should avoid, and you know, and this is my, my personal advice once again. In, in a household, in the structure, it is good to have structure, but it is bad to have a routine. And sometimes people think structure and routine are the same thing, but they're very different. Structure is for any institution, whether it be marriage or otherwise, to run and be upheld in a very intentional, strategic manner. That's structure. Routine is to do things repetitively. To the point that it becomes what? Without even emotion, without without even, you know, uh, like they say, I did it without even thinking. Why? Because it, I do it as a routine. So structure and routine are not the same thing. 
Someone can do something different while still having structure. But in routine is a repetitive, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, disconnected action. A routine action is, is an action that's done repetitive without any real connection to the action. So when marriage it, it, it becomes a routine, especially intimacy, becomes routine. What did the Prophet say? This deen is perfect. He said, لا يقع أحدكم الأمراتي كبعير أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام He said, don't let one of you fall on his wife like, a, like, like, like the camel does the she-camel. Meaning, instead of being into, he's mating. He's mating now. He's like a rabbit uh, or any other animal. Oh, it's spring. This is when we mate. That's it. Uh, and, and we do it until, uh, you know, <laughs> the action is done. You know, whoever, whoever relieves themselves first. They can tap out and then we're done. You know, and, and, and it's done like that. It shouldn't be done. The Prophet said, send a message to her first. So the Prophet told her, we have, this deen is perfect. We have narrations where we know the Prophet uh, um, in, even when the wise menses were on, he enjoyed the whole body of, of, his, of, his, of the narration comes to Sahih Muslim. Uh, uh, every part of her body except for, uh, um, you know, uh, penetration. You understand? So, what about all of this? And, and this is narrated from the mothers of the, of the believers. The fact the Prophet ﷺ and, and his playfulness would suck on her bottom lip and suck on her tongue. You know, so, you know, what happened is that, and, I, and, and honestly, you know, I'm biased. I'm biased. Uh, I believe it affected the women in a negative way more than the men. But honestly, both sides, men has, have lost chivalry. Because we, we opened up the text and it says we have rights. So we lost the chivalry. We lost the the, the, the, the cat and mouse, the, the chase. I remember that when I used to counsel youth in Egypt. And they would be engaged to a girl. And they couldn't stay out their little uh, Nokia phones texting the girl. Texting her, right? And I say, well, you know she's not your wife yet, right? And they say, yeah. So I said, okay. I said, this is what I want you to do. Do you love her? So a young man says, yes, I love her. I said, okay. Is that why you text her? He said, yeah, that's why I text her. I said, so only thing I want you to do at this point is when you marry her and she's in your home and you're not together the same way you are now, I want you to continue texting her. The same way you text Habibati. Uh, and all of that, all of the, you know, all of the flirting you're doing. <laughs> once she crosses that threshold and enters your home, don't stop flirting. Don't stop playing games. Don't stop the chase. See, we, this is on us, Ikhwa, we stop the chase once we catch. We did it in Jahiliya. You know, you move to the next chase. And we've Taking that mannerism into Islam. I'm engaged to the sister. We're calling the wakil. Now, uh, uh, I just want you to tell the sister this. Can I send the sister a gift? Can I? Uh, uh, uh, the chase is on when, when, when, when, when the engagement is there, right? Or can we have another sit down? Can I see the sister again? Because I didn't really see her height, right? Can I see yeah. her? Okay, because she wear... <laughs> we got so much game when the chase is in effect. But after we catch, we stop the chase. And... Part of what made the woman fall in love with us, Ikhwa, was the way we chased. Other, if other brothers chased, us, chased her before us. Why did we catch? Our chase game was better than the last guy. So we caught. But then we stopped the chase. And we put her in the house. And nobody else, we realized, like, Ikhwa, I'm going to get on us for a minute in this one. We, do we realize that we take them, and I'm talking about the idea situation. We take them out of school. We take them off their jobs. We take them out their father's home. We put them in our home. If we look at the ayat in Surah An-Nur, where Allah said to the, tell the believing men to lower their gaze and guard their private parts. And then Allah said, tell the believing women to lower their gaze and guard, uh, guard their private parts. And then at the end of the ayat, huh? وَلَا يَضْرِبْنَا أَرْجُلُهُنَّ And they shouldn't strike their feet, what? To reveal what's under it. Under their garment. The ulama explain in this ayah, in this ayah, 
that is from the fitra of the woman to one attention. Now, we can have up to four. They only can have us. So that means, especially if you marry a woman who was sought after, you have to replace all of that seeking, all of those men that was call, that were calling her father or calling the imam of the masjid or, you know, and trying to sit down. All of that attention she was, all of the chase that was going on, you now are responsible to fulfill and fill that void of her feeling wanted. Everybody that wanted her has to be in you as her husband. So now you have to keep it up, right? Likewise, on the other side, the men. The men, a lot of sisters don't understand, they may marry a man who's in high demand. Many sisters are asking about him. He's turning this one down and considering this one and turning that one down before, during, you know, for before and after her presence in his life. So now that woman, and then when he goes into the workplace, he's also in demand, maybe even from non-Muslim women. It's probably especially from non-Muslim women. So now she has a husband that's in high demand. So now she has to meet that demand. And also she has a, a husband that's being exposed to fitna of seeing other women. So now all of this, all of this has to be in consideration that each spouse have to, has to offer the other the attention that they lose when they get married. You know, and, and, and that's, that's a, a, big, a big point, especially for the men, because we still get attention after marriage. The women don't. In the ideal situation, she's in the house. Men don't see her. They don't ask about her. It's done. Oh, that sister got married. It's over with. So now you are all of the attention, everything that makes her feel wanted, everything that makes her feel desired, everything that makes her feel loved, it's all in your lap. So if you want to bring the, the, the, um, the, um, uh, uh, uh, the spice back, you have to do what you did that got it started in the first place. Wallahu a'la wa a'la. Yeah, I'm about to Well, what we'll do now is I'll let his brother give his, his last word and her thought in before we conclude this particular um, episode, inshallah. It's almost two. We've almost been talking for two hours. Yeah. I'll start with you, Ismail. Okay. Um, just to kind of piggyback on what Ustad and Hassan said, regarding um you know the rekindling uh, you know of the relationship or you know the intimacy between husband and wife i couldn't agree more um I, you know that this is why we ask people when they say okay i want to get a divorce or i want out of this marriage it's like okay you know why have they come up with some reason oh well i'm not happy i'm bored i'm this or that it's like, okay, well, were you always like this? Was it always like that? Were you bored? I mean, you have two, three children. You've been married for years. Are you bored? Or was it always like this? No. Before we used to go out, we used to do this, we used to do that. So now at least we, you know, somewhat pointed out where the problem was coming from. And now it's just a matter of, like you said, getting back to those things that gave the marriage that richness, you know, and that um, normalcy. Or they gave the, the the the relationship rather that that richness and that normalcy. You know what I'm saying? Like people, they they literally just have to examine whatever it is they went through and try to um, you know, or examine whatever the history of their relationship is. And go back to that point. I mean, and it's not always easy to do that because as uh, Ostel and Najib just mentioned, he said. If a woman has children back to back, for example, a circumstance has changed. You know what I'm saying? So now you have to be more creative. The bottom line is if those, if let's say, for example, they were going out more and now they have children, um, and in a lot of cases, you know, there's always a, a way to get at least a portion of what, you know, um, the husband and wife had. But I honestly ultimately believe that. Um, the best marriages when it comes to intimacy and love and that kind of mercy, the best are those marriages where the spouse, the, the, the spouse of two spouses literally can just look at each other and appreciate, you know, all the good qualities that they know the other person possess. 
even if they don't have the ability, you know, to produce that part of themselves or to make that part of themselves active or activate the part of themselves right now due to whatever circumstances, if you know, okay, my wife over here, she's like this, she's like that. Normally she's like this, she's like that, but she's going through something or she's too busy, she's too overwhelmed. We have to kind of look at people for, you know, who we know them to be, who we know they have the potential to be, who they are under normal circumstances and kind of isolate that and separate that from who they may be, you know, right now at this moment because of whatever it is they're going through. You know what I mean? I think that it's really just about perspective and being patient. You know what I mean? Provided it's not like a horrible, you know, toxic, crazy relationship where the arm is outweighing the, the good. Most of the time people, you know, they're just going through something. And, um, you know, it's only a matter of time, inshallah, before it gets rectified. So they should be patient, not public. And Barakalo Fig. Hassan, you got any last thoughts? Hassan, can you hear me? I apologize, I was muted. Uh, I, I was going to say that I, you know, I just, you know, wanted to really say that um, what what what I fear for the for the Muslims is um, getting caught up in societal norms and allowing what is a valid excuse according to societal norms make them believe that that would be an excuse when they stand before Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala especially in this time of uh, mental illness, everything's mental illness, you know? And uh, so basically, only society, everybody's crazy according to, you know, the mental illness, you know, they have a, a name for everything that you do wrong. It can be turned turn into a mental illness. And what they mean by that is you're excused. You know, um, backbiting and, and, and, and slander have been called now venting. You know, in order to, they call it healing, venting, so you can heal, as if the person who does it is not, you know, acquiring sin by doing it. Um, refusing to give one another the rights that Allah Taala has legislated on both parties, the male and the female, that uh, the society has made excuses for that. They said because of you know what's going on in society, both spouses have to work and. And that the woman cannot see herself based on goals, the goals of the couple. She cannot see herself as not being given her rights if she's required to work by her husband while at the same time fulfilling all of his rights while carrying the burden with him and like that. So um, the most have to be, care be, careful, be careful of riding the wave and, and falling in line with societal norms. And you have to realize that the prophet said glad tidings to the strangers. And if you're living in society today and you don't feel strange, you may need to check how you, how well you're actually implementing this religion. If you don't feel strange today, that might, that, that, that most likely is not a good sign. Nah. Long time. Well, with that said, uh, I hope that the brothers and sisters listening benefited from that which was presented and hopefully it'll be the means to, for, for those that may be having any type of problems and or issues in, within their marriage, uh, it'll be the means uh, to rectify the situation by Allah's permission. And this is the, this is the point of heavyweight dialogue, to converse about these issues in a simple way but likewise provide some type of solution to people that may be uh, faced with whatever topic we're dealing with. So I won't take up too much more time from, from, my, from the guests, you know, uh, for all those that came out and listened. Uh, if you benefited, then that's a lot of Barakatala's mercy upon you. But without a doubt, that is what is hoped. So with that, سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت استغفرك وأتوب إليك. To the listening audience, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.